Uh, we'll begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for everybody who's gathered here. For those that are uh, not able to be here today for one reason or the other or are still coming late, we ask, Lord, that your blessing will be, be, be upon them. Uh, be with them in these doctor appointments and all of the things that they have going on. Uh, keep them healthy and well and strong. And be with us, Lord, as we try to be healthy and strong, too. And we know that uh, there are things that we can do for our physical health, but this we also do for our spiritual health, to gather here together to study your word, uh, to read and meditate on it. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would be with us as we do that today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Well, now they're all coming in. Sure. Amen from the home. Yep, yep. I, I am. I try to be punctual. <laughs> you have to set the example. Yeah. Well, I don't always end on time, so that's the... <laughs> All right, um, we are going to finish the handout from last week. If you have it, I have a few extra here, but not a ton. Um, just had some clothes, of course, Bob, because he turns his in every time. Yeah. Uh, I figured we were done. Yeah. Well, no, I, I said I'm, I'm almost done, but um, yeah, there's, there's one, one more for somebody. Um, so the, the story last week was Jesus' disciples going through the field on a Sabbath, and they, they pluck some heads of the wheat, and uh, they, get, they get nailed by the Pharisees. The Pharisees come up to Jesus, and they're like, hey, hey, they're doing what's, what's unlawful on the Sabbath, and, and how can you stand for this? And so we, we looked at um, one of these passages from the um, Midrash that, that does say that one of the 39 activities that shows that you would break the Sabbath is, is reaping. Um, and plucking that grain is, is an example of that. Um, and Jesus obviously doesn't even really accept the premise of the complaint. Um, you're doing what's unlawful on the Sabbath. And he answers these Pharisees with this question about David and the Old Testament. Haven't you ever heard how David and his men ate that bread uh, in the house of the Lord when they weren't supposed to? Um, and this is the, the bread of the presence in the tabernacle that it's set out every week. And um, again, it is that reminder that we don't live on bread alone, but the word of God. But God did feed his people that manna, that bread from heaven during their wilderness wandering. And they, they always had enough. So there's these loaves of bread. And each week the priest would replace the loaves and put new loaves there. And then they would, they would get to eat the loaves that had been there um, that, that week. Um, obviously in, in those days, you know, they, they made some good crusty bread so that you're like, I won't, I wouldn't want to eat bread that's been sitting out for a week, but, uh, you know, make it with real ingredients and the, the crust, it, it preserves, you know, the bread well. So it, it really was a good thing that they got to eat that bread. But what happened is on this particular occasion, David and his men come and they want to eat because they're hungry and the priest feeds them that bread. Jesus's point is they broke the law and no, nobody called them out for it. In fact, the priest sort of encouraged it. Um, and so you Pharisees who are all bent on all of these rules how do you explain the fact that people sometimes break the rules and God's okay with that? Um, may, maybe you guys have the wrong approach to everything. And so he asked that question, um, haven't you read that? Don't you know that? Then sort of pauses, there's no response. What are they supposed to say? Oh yeah, that, that is true. Um, um. And then his conclusion to that is, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, okay? And his point there is the, the Sabbath isn't meant to be a burden to people. And with all of the rules, like, you're so worried about what you can't do on that day that you're never actually able to appreciate the day for what it is for, um, the time that they have to come together in worship and to be fed by, by God's word. So the Sabbath wasn't ever meant to be a burden to people, but the way the Pharisees have been applying it, if somebody is in need and it's the Sabbath, 
well, you kind of ignore that person or you ignore that need. And Jesus is pointing out that's that's not necessarily true. So on that particular day, the disciples were hungry. Was it wrong for them to eat? Well, was it wrong for David and his people to eat on that day? The Bible says no. So it wasn't wrong for these disciples to eat either. So that in itself should have been enough. But Jesus goes further. And the last thing that he says, the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So the conversation ends at this point in time, but he's just opened this huge can of worms. It's, a, it's one of those mic drop moments. The son of man, and when he says that, he's, he's referring to himself. Um, the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath to Jews is God's day. It's the Lord's day. So for anybody else to say, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath, what is Jesus saying about himself? Well, it's, it's blas- it sounds like blasphemy. If, if you don't believe Jesus, it sounds like blasphemy, uh, which he's already been charged with for forgiving the paralytic his sins. So, I mean, Jesus just confronts these Pharisees and he gives them everything they need to keep chart, you know, they're, they're keeping the record of all of his wrongs and they're going to use all of this against him. Um, but again, we know he's speaking the truth. So what he's saying actually is true. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. So they're trying to come up with all of these rules of how to keep the Sabbath. But here you have the Lord of the Sabbath. And if he's the one in charge, anything he says actually is approved. Um, even if like you, you're looking at the law and you're like, well, that's not what the law says. But here's the one who gave the law. He, his word trumps everything. Okay, so that's, that's all of the, the story. But there's sort of this, why is David mentioned that, that I want to bring up? Well, okay, so is the precedent that Jesus is giving that David is at this time anointed king of Israel? And is it just a principle of, um, you know, the rules don't apply to me? I, I'm the king. I'm, I'm above the law. You all are under the law, but I'm above the law. Um, that might be the case, but he, he points out that it's not just David who eats, it's all of the people who are with him, all of his soldiers, um, they're, they're also going to eat. And well, they're, they're not above the law. Um, well, I think the, the better thing is that David as the anointed one, he's anointed king, but it's that word anointed. In Hebrew, he's the Messiah. Anyone who is anointed is is a Messiah. That's just the, that's just what the word is. To anoint is to make one a Messiah. In the Old Testament, we've talked about this a few times, I think. Priests, kings, and prophets were all people who were anointed, who were all made little messiahs. And all of them had a specific function. They were set apart by God to do a specific thing, a priest to receive the sacrifices and to give um, that, that word of forgiveness to people, to speak on God's behalf. A prophet was the, the mouthpiece. Uh, you're the go-between. God tells the prophet what to say. The prophet tells the people. And the king is that royal figure to show um, the rule that just as God rules over all things, he he puts in place these intermediary rulers who rule on his behalf. David here is, is a king, a, a king who is a Messiah. But in, in the rest of the Old Testament, from David on out, priests kind of fade into the background. You'll, you'll still hear about priests. Prophets take a little bit of precedence. But honestly, the only reason prophets take precedence in the Old Testament after David is because the kings stopped doing what God wanted the kings to do. 
So the reason we hear so much about the prophets is the prophets get that unenviable task of going to the kings and saying, you're not listening to God anymore. Um, and we know that that was not a very comfortable thing. Think about Elijah. Um, Elijah had uh, Ahaz and Jezebel, uh, and they were both evil, wicked, wicked, a king and a queen, respectively. And Elijah would stand up to their face and say, you're, you're doing what is wrong. And there was even the famous contest between Elijah and the prophets of Baal, where to, to show who the one true God is, I'll make an altar for God. All of you prophets of Baal, you make your altar and we'll both offer sacrifices. And whoever's God hears and accepts the sacrifice, we'll know that's the one true God. And all of the, the sons of Baal, the, the prophets of Baal, they do their thing and nothing happens. Nothing happens. Of them. Yeah, yeah. They're dancing. They're, you know, singing. They're, they're doing all this stuff. Nothing happens. And then it's Elijah's turn. And he's like, well, let's douse our altar with with water, you know, just make it, make it impossible for God to, because for the offering to be received, it's going to have to be lit, right? And Elijah just makes it even harder, but he prays and fire comes down from heaven. The whole altar is consumed. And you would think then that's the moment everybody would be like, oh, we repent, we repent. <laughs> we're all, we're all wrong. But instead what happens is Ahaz and Jezebel like, kill that man, kill that man. And, and Elijah runs and runs and runs for his life. So that's the job of a prophet. It's an unenviable job, but it's because the kings have sort of given up their role. Because from David on, the kings become prominent because of a, a prophecy that God gives to David that one day your son is going to rule on a throne that will last forever, a kingdom that will never end. We recognize that as a prophet of Jesus. Jesus is the king of kings. He brings the kingdom of God. That's what the language of Mark begins with, right? Jesus is coming to bring the kingdom of God. Who brings the kingdom of God other than the king? The, the king's kingdom goes with the king. Um, so... The connection with David goes back to the fact that he's the Messiah, he's the king, but Israel is waiting for the Messiah, the king, the one to come. And if David can do this, the real king is truly the Lord of the Sabbath, is the one who, who calls all of the shots. So... I think he calls David's story in, into play because of who David is, because he wants the people to see who he is. Jesus will not go around saying, I'm God, I'm the Messiah, because it, it would people would not have accepted that, or if they would, they would have misunderstood it and so he does this sort of backward or if you did the homework, if you listened to what he said, if you saw what he did, you would reach the correct conclusion. So he, he wants people to do that. But the Pharisees never do. The Pharisees just see Jesus as being um, this, this complete rule breaker. And, and so he has to die. But... On this occasion, the problem that they have technically isn't with Jesus, it's with the disciples. They don't ever say, Jesus, you were walking in the field and you were plucking the grains. Right now, it's just the connection between Jesus and his disciples. The next story is going to be all about Jesus, though. So I just wanted to let us reflect a little bit more. Why David? Why is he so important? It's because David is this figure, the Messiah. And Jesus will be called son of David. And when they say that, that's what they mean. You're the one. You're that promised one that we've been waiting for who would be the king over all of, all of God's people. Um, so David, David is important. Jesus knows exactly what he's doing. And, and yet you, do, you have to connect some of the dots. It's not, it's not right there. But if you know the Bible well, and he says, haven't you read? 
Do you know the Bible? Do you know what it's all about? No, you guys don't know what it's about because you're too busy focused on your little rules book, and, and that's not it. All right, any other thoughts, questions? We'll get into the big show then. Today is another Sabbath story, and this one is all about Jesus. He, he draws the attention. He, um, he, if, if he did nothing in the story, there wouldn't be a story here. But he, he knows exactly what he's doing. He knows exactly what attention that it's going to draw. And he does it anyway because the kingdom of God is here. And uh, he wants people to know. So this story really, it, it, it pushes back against this notion that we've addressed slightly that Jesus doesn't want people to tell others about who he is. Um, we had that on an occasion where he healed a man and, and he said, don't tell other people. Um, instead, go to the priest and, and that was it. And again, well, why shouldn't he tell people? He didn't say you, you shouldn't ever tell people. He said, first go to the priest and, and then... Um, in that context, the reason Jesus gave for not telling was because he wanted to go to all of the villages. And if people knew about his miracles beforehand, he couldn't move about freely. And so it would actually stop him from doing the thing that he wanted to do, which was to let other people know about the kingdom of God. So um, he sort of has a reason for it. This story in chapter 3 if Jesus' job is to try to keep a secret, explain this story. Because he, again, is the one that draws attention to himself in front of a crowd of people in a synagogue on a Sabbath. This is all they're going to be talking about. So um, it's not that he doesn't want people to know. It's that, that he does have a mission and a way that he's doing things. And it's happening on his terms. Okay, so it starts a new chapter. This is now chapter three, but it's really so closely connected with what came before it. It's a story about a, a, a Sabbath violation, maybe, um, but actually in that Sabbath is a, a way to see Jesus for who he really is. Chapter three, verses one through six. Again, he, that is Jesus, entered the synagogue and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. And said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. So you have, this, the story develops quite nicely. They watch Jesus. They are plotting in their hearts. Who, who are these they? Well, from the context, you, sure, you sort of know the two groups that have been against Jesus so far have been the scribes and the Pharisees, and sometimes the scribes and Pharisees are described as, as the same group of people. They're these individuals uh, from the Jewish faith that their focus is on the, the law and keeping the law, and this is really what God wants most of all, and, and you have to understand these people aren't just um, people bent on on hell. Um, they they do kind of have good motives. It's God's law. It, it has to be important to us. But it's possible even for people with good motives to lose sight of what's really important. And Jesus shows these people as as being that they've lost sight of what is the most important thing. Um, yeah, but, but they, they don't think that they're doing wrong at all. No, I mean they're they they're in the right. They've been brought up that way. They right. agreed to to be you know scribes and Pharisees. <clears throat> so 
And anybody that doesn't do what they think is mm. right is just a transgressor. And right, right. You're, and, you're a bad person. Right. And, and again, not all Pharisees are bad. Some Pharisees end up becoming Jesus' yeah. disciples. But these Pharisees that are described here, um, I think anybody with half a brain can see these, these, are, these are some bad guys. Because put aside your religious scruples and think about the question Jesus says. Is it lawful to do good or to do harm, to save a life or to kill? I mean, even, even take out the word on the Sabbath. It's, it's pretty easy, right? It's, it's always better to do good. Um, all of the commandments are directed to us doing good. Um, and yet, Jesus here is going to do something that is clearly good. A, a man has, has a withered hand. Um, it's, it's hard to know exactly what is the illness behind this. Um, it could have been paralysis. Um, the, I've heard a conjecture of polio. Again, he, he doesn't have the use of his hand. Um, and so he's, he, is, he is not whole. Um, and, and he suffers because of that. Obviously, if you don't have the full use of your body, you're, you're going to suffer in life. Think how good that guy must have felt. Yeah. So, so here's a guy who's suffering. It, is it right to help this man? Or is that, is that not right? That's not even the question Jesus asks. He says, is it, is it okay to help this guy? Or would it be better to hurt him? So the options Jesus give make it pretty clear. Um, duh, it's, it's, it's better to help somebody. Um, obviously, everybody's going to side with that. Um, that wasn't the question the Pharisees were asking, though. They, they were simply, we know what work is. We know what not work is. It's obviously better to not do work because it's the Sabbath. But again, Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. And he's changing the whole way that they think about that day. And he can do that because he's the Lord of the Sabbath. So on this day, should you do good or should you do harm? Now, the overview of the story, who did good on this day? Jesus. Okay. And what was the good that he did? He, he just yeah. talked. He didn't even touch him. He didn't. Yeah. He, he just spoke and he healed that man and, and all was well. Um, did anybody do harm on this day? The Pharisees, no, perhaps. Pharisees, but they're, yeah. But they, uh... of them. Mm -hmm. So the Pharisees didn't commit an act. Neither did Jesus, frankly. As Beverly said, he just spoke. But in his speaking, a man was healed. The Pharisees, did they do anything? Not really, but what did they do? They got together, and in their speaking, how to destroy this man. Mm -hmm. And and they held counsel on the Sabbath. That yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, again, that's... It, it, they didn't do any work. They talked and, and gathered. Um, it's, it's, but, but what's clearly wrong, again, <clears throat> Jesus, it's, it's not about doing work or not doing work. The real question is, can you do good or should you do evil? Jesus clearly did good. They clearly are, are doing evil. Again, maybe not through actions yet, but through the words, through the meeting, they, they are planning all of this. So you read the story, who's the good guy and who's the bad guy? They're trying to paint Jesus as the bad guy. They're looking for a way to accuse him. But by their own deeds, the Pharisees have shown themselves to be the, the bad ones. In their eyes, they're doing everything right. Of course they are. And Jesus recognizes this. We'll talk about that too. But, but just on the surface, you see it's about doing good or doing harm. Jesus is the only one that did good on that day. Meanwhile, they, they, they're not neutral. They're, they're in the harm camp. They're trying to kill. They're trying to take a life. So um, this, this story kind of marks a conclusion of a series of, we've had five stories 
where controversies have come and Jesus has been accused of doing something wrong, this is the climax. This, this is finally it. They've, they've heard enough and they're making active plans. Now that could have happened towards the beginning when, he, when Jesus forgave the paralytic and they said, who can forgive sins but God? This is blasphemy. Blasphemy technically is a, a crime that deserves a capital punishment. But, but they didn't do anything. So why did they wait until this step? I mean, the first commandment is broken when you, when you commit blasphemy. You shall have no other gods but one. And blasphemy is you are either taking God's place or you're maligning him. So that should be the most serious violation. But it wasn't until this one that they finally got so fed up. And I think it's, again, to show who they were. They prided themselves, and we see this later on, but they prided themselves on their outward observance. Fasting, that was a thing. We fast, you feast. They, they prided themselves on, we're the ones that take our faith seriously, and, and you're just making fun of all of this, and you're, you're mocking it. The Sabbath was the most public witness of somebody's faith because all Jews did it all on the same day, and, and you could see it. You could see it. I mean, if you're walking around doing business, you're, you're obviously not serious about any of this. So I think it was because they didn't care about the first commandment, honestly. I mean, they threw that charge out against Jesus, but what they cared most about was their own outward righteousness. And here Jesus was taking that away from them. And so they were losing it all. I wonder what would happen if the Antichrist came to life and came amongst us like Jesus came to the hmm? Pharisees. How would we react to somebody saying, well... Follow what I say, well, don't, and I'll, you know, it'll perform all these miracles. Yeah. And I'll, what would we, as a as a Christian group, say to? to I'll we, I'll do you one better, Bob, and it's not if it the Antichrist, any any force, any person that speaks in the place of Christ or against Christ, is that Antichrist yeah. and. We have those people in our world all the time. What do we do? What do we say about that? Well, some um, people actually follow them. You know? uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, the truth of God's word um, stands, and, and we speak the truth, and the other side can, can speak lies. Um, we don't follow the lies. We don't believe the lies, but we, we call out the, the light of Christ yeah. um, in, in that darkness. So it's, it's not a matter of if. It, we, we live in that world. Yeah. Um, all right, so that's, that's the big picture thing here. This, this is the climax. The stage is set. Um, as, as Julius Caesar said, the die has been cast. We now know how the story is going to end. I mean, we did anyway, but these Pharisees, it's, it's now when and how do we finish this guy off? Um, so you're going to read about more opposition. That's, that's already been there, but what, what Jesus is going to do in the face of that, it, it's not going to change him. He's, he's on his mission. He's going to do his thing, and what the Pharisees won't know and cannot possibly understand is that they will actually bring about the very thing that he came to do. So by destroying him, they're not actually going to bring harm <laughs> I mean, they are to Jesus, but they're going to bring about the salvation that we all need, that they don't see and understand. All right, so we'll go through it now slower. Again, he entered the synagogue. Um, again, because this is the second time Jesus has been in the synagogue. The first time, uh, we just read it in church on Sunday in our church, um, back in chapter one, was he enters the synagogue to teach for the first time. This is just after he called the, the two sets of disciples, uh, Simon and Andrew, James and John. It's, it's Sabbath. He goes to the synagogue. We said that's that's what Jews would do. It's their day of worship. So the synagogue is, is their little church. 
Um, the temple is way in Jerusalem, but um, you don't always go to the to Jerusalem. You would do that on the the really high important days like Passover um, and so forth. But on a regular Sabbath, you go, and what happens in the synagogue is they read the the scripture, and then a, a teacher will expound on it. We'll explain. It's like the, the sermon. Um, that's where all of that comes from. It goes back to the synagogue times. We're not really doing anything new. Well, Jesus was teaching on that day. Um, and Mark doesn't tell us anything that Jesus taught, which is a little frustrating. Um, but while he's teaching, there's this guy with an unclean spirit shouts out, you know, we know who you are. You're Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, you're the Holy One of God. Have you come to destroy us. And my sermon on Sunday was Satan, and the demons are speaking on behalf of Satan. Um, Satan only knows how to do one thing. God creates life. God gives life. Satan only knows one thing, how to destroy. And so... When Jesus comes, the demon recognizes Jesus, exactly who he is, but cannot understand, cannot understand God's ways. Um, and so, surprise, um, what, what are you doing here? You must come to destroy, because that's all Satan knows. But Jesus didn't come to destroy the demon. Jesus was coming to save us. But that connection, all Satan knows is how to destroy. Look at the end of the story. What do these guys know? They only know how to destroy. So there's this connection. The first time Jesus is in the synagogue, he is confronted by this man with an unclean spirit. I'm not saying that the Pharisees are possessed by a demon spirit, but they're not listening to God. And if you're not listening to God, there's only one other option. You're listening to, to Satan and his playbook. So they're following that playbook in their actions. So there's this connection. Chapter one, a synagogue story. Have you come to destroy us? Here, chapter three, the Pharisees are going to try to destroy Jesus. And once you're shaved by grace, I mean... Yes, yes. Um, you're you're get, you're gonna get us off. They have to watch. They have to watch the sermon if they want that. Um, so again, that's that's the word. It's pointing out he's done this before. He's entered a synagogue before. It doesn't say it's on a Sabbath, but the fact that he's in a synagogue, it's sort of by context. And then as you keep reading, ah, oh yes, it is. It is a Sabbath. Jesus enters the synagogue. The disciples, you know, all of that. But he, Mark doesn't care about anybody else at this point in time. This is no longer about what the disciples are doing. That was the last Sabbath story. Look at your disciples. Look at what they're doing. They're doing what's wrong. This is only going to be about what Jesus does on this day. Um, but he's not there alone. There's also a man with a withered hand. And in, in a sense, I don't want to say that Mark doesn't care about this this man with the withered hand, but it's it's almost like the guy is a prop. Um, again, I, I, I think he was real, genuine, this man was healed, but, you know, we have questions, right? Like that story with the paralytic. Like his friends brought him there. Um, we hear about other people, that other people bring these people who are sick uh, or demon-possessed, they bring them to Jesus. But there just happens to be a guy who's here. We don't know anything about this guy. And, you know, my mind is wondered, uh, did the Pharisees bring this guy because they know how Jesus operates? And they know that Jesus seeing a sick person, <laughs> Jesus is going to heal that, one, that guy. Um, yeah, so is it a trap? Mark doesn't say that. Um, again, we don't, we don't know anything. I mean, this guy could have just come for worship, just like a regular ordinary person, and, and that is his full right. But Jesus is there, and there's this guy. But because there is this guy, whether they brought him or not, the Pharisees, they've been scanning the crowd, and they understand the situation, and they want to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath. 
which to me is another great whose phone's going off is is another great accusation or con- sign of condemnation against the Pharisees. They want to see whether he would heal him or not. Not they wanted to see whether he could heal him or not. What what has already been granted? That he can heal. That he can heal. And they know it and they can't explain it. You know, it, 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 but he can heal people. They can't do that. Um, that, should, that should give them pause, right? But they're using Jesus's power of healing as a means for him to condemn himself. Yeah, they, they, they use this as a trap. But again, gosh, if, if you're already granting that you know that this guy can heal people, there are no parlor games. There are no tricks. They just know it. They, they cannot deny it. That, that, should, that should put them six feet under. However, at one point, they did accuse him of his powers coming from Beelzebub. That's going to come up. Yep, oh, we're, okay. we're going we're gonna to get to that. Cause, get to that. Yeah, but, but yeah, so again, the one thing that they just cannot accept is that he's from God. So you're right, Eileen. What's the only other? You have to be doing this with the power of Satan. They're going to try that, and he'll have a response to that too. Um, yeah. So these guys are just they're 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 really not good. And Mark wants you to see just how bad it is. At this point in time, though, verse two, it just says they. He doesn't define who those folks are. He does at the end. Um, so. Remember in the story of Jesus healing the paralytic, um, when Jesus forgave the man's sins, the the Pharisees, the scribes, it was the scribes in that story, they didn't say anything, but Jesus perceived in their hearts that they were thinking, this is blasphemy, this is blasphemy. So that that was another sign of his, his divine power. He, he can read minds. He knows exactly what's going on. In this instance, they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so they might accuse him. No one has said anything, but Jesus knows what's going on. So they know that there is a trap. And what do you do? You spring the trap. Do, do the thing that they are waiting for. Verse 3 Jesus says to this man with the withered hand, come here. The Pharisees didn't say, Jesus, there's somebody sick here. You want to do something about that? Um, The disciples didn't bring this man to his attention. This man didn't come forward to Jesus. This is all at Jesus's own instigation. So again, he's... He's not shying away from these controversies. He's not avoiding it. He, he steps forward and he's like, okay, let's, let's do this, guys. Let's do this. He knows what they're thinking. Mm-hmm. Come here. And we don't hear anything else about this guy until verse 5. But this essentially is the same kind of words that Jesus would use of those disciples. Come, come, follow me. Come, come here. And so there's nothing in this specifically about this man's faith that contrasts with the healing of the paralytic of your, your faith has saved you um, to the to these young men uh, as well um, but the response is a response of faith so that man with the withered hand believes something about Jesus too otherwise he wouldn't have come up there otherwise he wouldn't do the things that Jesus asked him to do so uh, here all we know about this withered guy with a withered hand, he's here in a synagogue one day uh, and he leaves healed, but he listens to Jesus. So he shows himself to be a disciple of Jesus just in the fact that Jesus calls him to do something and, and without question, without any complaint, he, he does it. Verse four, he said to them. So verse three, he, he, he sees this guy with a withered hand, come here. Come up, come up. He says to them, though, and who's the them? The them is the they 
who are trying to find a way to accuse him if he would heal on the Sabbath. Um, so there, there is this interesting question. Reaping on the Sabbath, the last story, there clearly were rules against that. Is there a rule against healing on the Sabbath? Like, not really, is, is the problem. So they're waiting to see if Jesus would heal somebody on the Sabbath. Even healing isn't technically a violation of any of the Pharisees' rules. So e even more, it shows that they're trying to trap Jesus in a violation, which really technically isn't even a violation. Um, and so Jesus himself, he's not going to say, is it right to heal or not? Because that, that really wasn't a point of contention. The things that are, are forbidden on the Sabbath are regular, ordinary, day-to-day -day activities. We read through that list of 39 things last week, so it's in your handout. Um, healing somebody is not a regular every ordinary everyday ordinary activity so it wasn't something that they would ever like even think oh yeah you have to come up with a rule hey guys stop healing everybody on the sabbath you can do it on all the other days but don't do it on the set like no if if somebody's healing another person you sort of recognize that it is a god thing and you, you don't put rules on that kind of stuff. I wonder what they would say if he healed one of their withered hands. Yeah, well... What did they do then? Uh, we, we don't know because he didn't do it. Yeah. Where Jesus will get into trouble is when he does things in the healing process that would have constituted work. So he makes mud on, on the Sabbath to heal the guy's eyes who's blind. That's in John's gospel. Um, he heals a paralytic and he tells him, take up your mat and walk. Well, to lift up his mat, that would have been an act of work. And so Jesus, in healing the man, the healing technically was, was fine. But when you tell him to do work by lifting up his mat, that's where they, they'd nail him. Okay. So... So just healing itself, it's technically okay. And, and Beverly was absolutely right. The way that he did it, he didn't physically do anything to heal this man. He just spoke and this man's um, arm was, or his hand was healed. So what is their accusation even? What's the basis of it? It, it doesn't even have a legal basis in their own interpretation of the law, which is another strike against them. They, they just, they're, they're completely out of their heads. So Jesus is trying to frame it correctly. And that's why he, he uses the words that he does, because it paints a picture. He's on one side, they're completely on the other side. So is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? I'm going to do good. You guys are continuing to plot harm to save a life. He's going to not. I know in this in this healing, it doesn't look like he's saving a man, but he's he's restoring life to him. And so in that sense, he is saving him or, or to kill um, that for Jesus really is the question. And their response. Silence. Once again, when Jesus asked them a question, they refused to answer. And rhetorically, when, when somebody speaks and you don't have an answer, like, like in a debate usually, that's, that's a sign of defeat. It's concession of like, but, 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 I, I don't have any more. You, you, you win. So Jesus here in that synagogue wins the argument just by their silence. But their silence is even more convicting because, are you kidding me? Jesus didn't answer, ask a, tw a trick question, did he? Anybody should have been able to give the answer. Is it lawful to do good or to do harm? Who's going to say to do harm? Nobody. That should be their answer. Well, of course, Jesus, it's right to do good. Why won't they say that? 
Why, why can't they say that? Why can't they give the answer that everybody knows is the correct answer? Because they're the building a case. Because they're building a case? It would support Jesus. Because it would support Jesus. It, it would show them as completely morally bankrupt and that all of their righteousness really was just a sham and a show. Again, later on, Jesus calls these, these people whitewashed tombs. Mm -hmm. it, on the outside, oh, it's pristine, it's white, but open up that tomb and it's stanky inside. It, is, it, it smells like rotting dead people. And that's their heart. They're, they're completely dead inside. Um, and these questions are questions that could drive them to repentance. He, he's not condemning them. They have the chance to answer it correctly, but they refuse to. So Jesus, he looks around at them with anger. Why is he angry with them? Because they're so stubborn. Because they're so stubborn. That they, how much clearer could it be? Do good or to do harm? It's always wrong to do harm. It's always right to do good. Um, come on, guys. But they won't say that. It's that stubbornness. It's that disbelief. It's that refusal to acknowledge Jesus. Or even if you can't acknowledge Jesus, that, that question right there... Um, it wasn't asking for a confession that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. It's just be on the same page as God. So one other time previous to this in chapter one, Jesus was angry. And we talked about that. So if you weren't here, you missed it. Because there's this weird thing. In the original Greek, some manuscripts have Jesus was angry and some Jesus was compassionate. Um, and, and that's a little weird. And we said, you know, we could understand if it said angry, like, oh, I don't want an angry Jesus. Um, but if you, if you read the whole story, you understand that, that anger is a complex emotion. And Jesus certainly would have been within his right to be angry with a man afflicted by Satan because he loves all of God's people and he's angry at what sin has done to them. Okay, um, so that was an interesting scenario. Here, it's a little bit more clear. Why is he angry? Because the next line tells us. Jesus looked at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. So he's angry at their hardness of heart. That is their unbelief and, obstinance, yes. and obstinacy, that they will refuse to understand what is yeah. right in this situation. But... Even as he's angry, what's that other word that's in between anger and the hardness of heart? Grieve. He's, he feels sadness for them. Um, so even when God is angry, it's, it's not like you're all going to burn in hell. I want to destroy you all. That's, that's often how our anger works. <laughs> our, our anger as, as a human emotion is take no prisoners. You know, uh, the, if, if they're mean to me, they, they deserve everything that they're going to get. Um, even when God, here Jesus, is angry, his heart is broken because these are sinners that he died for. Jesus says, I haven't come for the righteous, but, but for the sinners. He's come for these people too. And they won't come to him. They, they will not listen to him. They just keep doubling down in their unbelief. Um, hardness of heart is probably most associated in the Bible with the story of Pharaoh. So just like Pharaoh refused to listen to Moses, God's prophet, and refused to let God's people go, um, the Pharisees are showing themselves to be of that same heart, to, to refuse to listen to, to God's word. But if you keep reading the Old Testament, you'd see that it's not just the Pharaoh that was hard of heart. God's own people over time are called the same thing, that they're stubborn or dull in their hearts. And, and what it means is that they refuse to listen to God. They refuse to listen to his prophets. 
Um, on the handout, I have on page, what is it? One, two, three, four. Backside of four. Um, so four, it uh, has Jeremiah 13.10, about halfway down. It's indented. Jeremiah 13.10. And uh, this is during the ministry of Jeremiah. And if you know, he was another one of those prophets that had the unenviable task of speaking to God's people and the king of, of that day. And, and they had already decided who they wanted to listen to, and it wasn't God. And so Jeremiah is often called the weeping prophet because he had this unenviable, nobody was going to listen to him. He was going to tell them, and he knew that that they wouldn't listen and they were all going to be destroyed and they're his family too. They're his people too. So here in Jeremiah 13, 10, um, this evil people, as is God speaking, who, and he's talking about his own people. He's talking about Israel and Judah. This evil people who refuse to hear my words, who stubbornly follow their own heart and have gone after their after other gods to serve them and worship them shall be like this loincloth, which is good for nothing. Um, that's God handing them over to judgment there. But the judgment comes only after they won't listen. I'm trying to tell them. I'm trying to give them a chance to be saved. But they won't listen. They stubbornly will only listen to their other gods these false gods and, and to follow their ways. And the Pharisees, it's the same exact, ex, exact stubbornness. They might think that they're serving God, but in their words and in their actions, as I pointed out back to the story in chapter one of this man with an unclean spirit, they're serving Satan and his purposes. They're, they're not listening to God. Um, and Jesus is grieved by that. He's, he's really grieved by that. God is compassionate. God is loving. He will judge the living and the dead. There is a heaven, there is a hell, but he would not have us be destroyed. And, and what more could Jesus do? How many opportunities has he given these Pharisees? And he's going to give them more after this. But how much clearer could he make it the way that you're living your life, it's not God's way. You're, you're following the wrong voice. Um, so what more can he do? He, he's shown them. He's spoken to them. He's showing patience toward them. Um, he's angry at, at their, their decisions. But in the anger, he's also grieved. Um, and, and that, to me, shows everything you need to know about God. Uh, does he love sin? Absolutely not. Does he, is he okay when, when we ourselves or others make the decision to, to follow um, Satan's ways or the world's ways? No, he's not happy with that at all. Uh, is he then just waiting for us to step out of line and say, finally, I can destroy that person? <laughs> I've been looking for it so much time. No, he's like that story of the father in the prodigal son in Luke 15. You're my son. You're my child. I've been waiting for you to come home, and, and finally you've come to your senses. There are innumerable forgiveness of God towards us. Mm -hmm. for, well, look at yourself mm -hmm. and myself, mm -hmm. all the wrongdoings I've done in my life, yep. you know? And he still wants me to be a follower of him. Yep, and, and to share and show that same forgiveness. Yeah. Forgiveness is the mark of the church. Um, I mean, yes, it's taking care of the fatherless, the widow, the orphan, all of those things from the Old Testament. But um, other people can do those things, too. What, what the world does not have, does not know, is forgiveness, even when people are unrepentant, even when they don't deserve it, because there is no other forgiveness. Um, and Jesus would share that forgiveness in a heartbeat with these people but they don't want it. They, they refuse it. So what more can he do with them? He, he moves on. And, and right now his attention focuses just on that man. And he speaks, stretch out your hand. And he's able to do what he should not have been able to do. Um, his hand is healed in that moment and restored. And 
That word restored is to me another word, a synonym of, of what Jesus has come to do. God's, God's creation at one point in time was perfect. It was, it was good. It was very good. But by listening to Satan's voice, it was ruined. Um, it is broken. And so God promises that he will make all things new, that there will be the new heavens and the new earth. Paradise restored. And Jesus comes ahead of time. That, that, that new creation, that final complete new creation has not happened. It comes when Jesus returns to judge the living and the dead. But in advance, Jesus has come. And what, is, what are people seeing around them? Creation is being restored. People whose bodies have been broken are now healed again. And, and so it's like everywhere he goes, he's bringing that little restoration. It's not perfect. It's not complete yet. But that is what he has come to do. Um, the problem is before there can be restoration, uh, the, the old must die. And so the cross will come before Easter Sunday, before the new life, the resurrected life. And, and so it is in our lives, too. Paul talks about this is what baptism is. In baptism, you're made a new creation. A restoration has happened. And it's because in your baptism, you're joined with Jesus, joined with his death, but also with his resurrection. And so in you, there is a new life. You, you can do these things that these Pharisees could not do because the Holy Spirit is at work in you. Um, Romans what? Romans 6 uh, is the, you've been buried with Jesus, joined with him in his baptism. Um, so the man stretches out his hand restored, and again, that, that's it. We don't hear anything more about this guy. We don't know his name. We don't know his story. All we know is he was, um, he was called into the presence of Jesus on this day, and he walked away restored because he listened to Jesus. Pharisees, they don't listen to Jesus. They're going to walk away bent on trying to destroy him. So concluding verse, the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him. How does it destroy him? Here we hear a new group, the Herodians, never heard of them before. You're not going to really hear much again until the very end. They're friends of Herod. Um, unofficially, whatever, that makes them pro-Roman. Herod rules on behalf of the Roman Empire. The Pharisees were totally against the Roman um, powers uh, being there. But the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So, so what drives these two together is their hearts bent on destroying Jesus. Because we've never heard of the Herodians up until this point in time, we might wonder what in the world do they have against Jesus? Well, again, this story seems to be putting to an end the opening section of Jesus's ministry, and you probably have forgotten it, but Jesus's ministry begins after John's ba John baptizing him with John was arrested, and then Jesus goes out and proclaims the good news. So it begins with noting Jesus's ministry begins as John is being arrested. You don't know it right there and then at Mark's gospel, but you know it from the other gospels. Who arrested John? Why was he arrested? Herod, Herod Antipas. He's the ruler of Galilee, this northern area. He arrested John because John spoke against Herod for his um, immoral behavior, taking his brother's wife as his own wife, thereby not only committing adultery, but forcing her to commit adultery um, and divorce and all, all sorts of bad things. But John spoke against that. He's a prophet. Sometimes the prophet has to speak to the powers and you have to speak the word of God and they may not like that. That's what happened with John. Now, here in chapter 3, it's, it's being wrapped up. Just as Herod imprisoned John and so silenced him, this isn't Herod himself, but these are his fan club, his supporters. 
hey, you know, once we shut up John, this other guy came and he's saying the exact same kind of stuff that John said. Do you want us to take care of him too? And so they found an ally in the Pharisees and the two are going to work together to try to put an end to Jesus. So again, in, in the story that Mark is telling, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? That still is going to be a constant story. But that first phase of his ministry comes to an end and controversy, 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 and finally some real resolve. Something's going to be done against Jesus and it's not good. All right. Any last thoughts? We went over a bit. Interesting story Mark is telling. Yeah, I, you know, it's just, I think, pretty commonly known that if you accept Christ, you have to change your life. Mm -hmm. And so, in my mind, I see that if you have little to lose, it might be easier to accept Christ. Mm -hmm. But when these guys mm -hmm. are faced with losing everything mm -hmm. in order to accept that he is God, you can see their resistance would be... Oh, absolutely. You know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, on, on, on the other hand, th think of the tax collectors. Mm -hmm. So they did not have esteem among the people. The people looked down upon them. But hey, money buys friends, right? So they, they would give all of that up. So, it, it, I mean, which God do you serve? Is it the God of power? Is it the God of popularity? Is it the God of money? Jesus asks us to forsake all of those idols. And you're right. Some, some are giving up a lot to do that. Right. Uh, others, not so much. You could see, like, you know, on, on paper, well, it's a relatively easy decision for you to make. You didn't have anything to lose. Um, but Jesus says we all have something to lose, our, our very life. Get, give it all up. Take up our cross and follow him. Okay. Thank you, guys. Uh, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, come to you at the uh, end of this first part of reading Mark's gospel and just kind of uh, bewildered at the reaction of the Pharisees and their resolve to destroy Jesus. And yet, Lord, there are many people in this world today that uh, follow the same voice, that follow Satan and his ways and his paths and uh, may not think that they're doing that. They may think that they're doing really good things in this world. But uh, we pray that you would help us, uh, yes, to be angry at sin when we see it, to be able to call uh, darkness, darkness, and light, light, to speak God's word in truth and love, but, but not just to be angry, but, but also to be grieved and to ha have hearts of compassion, just as Jesus did, because it is that compassion that has brought us mercy we too are sinners. We too are caught in our own wiles and in our own plans. But you have given us life through Jesus and you have called us to be his disciples. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.